We're talking about Paul's revelation uh, of the new creation. And I, I, you know, I just love teaching this for a selfish reason. <laughs> I get more out of it than you do. I guarantee you. Uh, this just is the stuff that transformed my life, that changed me uh, way, way, way back in the early 70s. And so I'm, I'm excited about getting into this. And uh, I, I'm very aware of the fact that none of this comes by just me saying the words. It comes by Holy Spirit illumination. So I'm gonna ask you to stand with me. And we've turned Paul's prayer in Ephesians 3 into a personal prayer. I mean, we just personalized it, basically. And I'm gonna have you read it with me as a prayer. All right, here we go. Father God, creator of everything in heaven and on earth, I pray that from your glorious unlimited resources, you will empower me with inner strength through your spirit. Then Christ will make his home in my heart as I trust in it. My roots will grow down into your love and keep me strong. Give me power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May I encounter and know the love of Christ, though it is too great to fully understand. <laughs> then I will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from you. All right, I wanna pray for all of us. Lord, I am asking you to do that for us and in us today. Only you can, can minister to our hearts, to our understanding. Only you can illumine us and awaken us. And so I'm asking you to do that today. I'm asking you to give me utterance. I'm asking you, God, to give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Spirit, speak to us. Show us great and mighty things that we don't know. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. You can be seated, thank you. I think if there's any one word that could begin to describe what the gospel is about, it's the word encounter. God designed us with a need to be close to him. The minute Adam and Eve sinned, they tried to hide. That's what sin does to it, it pushes us away, but that doesn't change the imprint that's in us. We still crave this relationship with our creator. Nothing begins to scratch that itch inside us. It's built into our human anatomy, in our DNA. My soul requires the presence of God to be healthy. It's like sunshine, I'm depressed without it. There's something wrong with me when it's not there. And the reason God made us this way is because that's what he wants. He doesn't need us, he, I mean, he's totally self-sufficient. His, his needs are completely met in the fellowship of the Trinity, but he, wants to share himself with us. He created us in his own likeness with a spirit, soul, and body to be able to relate to him on an intimate level. And the apostle Paul is the guy who really gets this, who, who sees it. God shows him the big picture of what Jesus' death and resurrection was all about. He sees the new creation and how that all works, how the whole cosmos is a part of this ingenious plan that God formulated uh, before time to have a family with Jesus as the head. We're, we're designed to be his eternal partner. That's why he became one of us, so that he could be the firstborn of the new creation. And the reason, when you read all of this in Paul's writing, it seems cryptic to us, especially when we're you know, reading it the first time, is because he's laying out the, the, the grand scope of God's plan. He, he gets this revelation of the new creation firsthand from Jesus, out in the desert of Arabia, and he calls it the mystery of the ages. In fact, I'm gonna read it to you here in Colossians 1.25. He says, God has called me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden from, for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the church. To them, God has chosen to make known the glorious riches of this mystery, which is, now here it is, let's read it, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now I think that right there is the most powerful reality knowable to humans. <laughs> and Paul's the first one to get it, right from the source, right from Jesus' lips. In his letter to the Romans, he lays out this cohesive picture 
of what the normal Christian life looks like. It was that first book that I ever, one of the first books I read was Watchman Knees, The Normal Christian Life, and, and he just goes through the book of Romans. Basically, in Romans, Paul is unlocking the mystery for us. Martin Luther said, when I discovered that, and he's referring to the, Paul's revelation in Romans, he said, I was born again of the Holy Ghost. The doors of paradise swung open and I walked through. He said, it's impossible to read or meditate on this letter too much. The more one deals with it, the more precious it becomes and the better it tastes. He thought every Christian should memorize all 16 chapters, which is 7,100 words. <laughs> I memorized the sixth chapter and thought that was a feat, man. I mean, it's, it's a lot of words. But Luther was on to something because what, what Paul is seeing is just so vast and so otherworldly, you can only absorb little bits of it at a time. He describes Christianity as more of this, uh, uh, more of a new reality than a religion. It's a supernatural way of living and relating to our creator that comes by revelation. In 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9, he says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But, look at this, I love this, but God has revealed it to us. How does he say? By his spirit. He's revealed it to us by his spirit. God it has to reveal it to us. So only by Holy Spirit illumination can we see or know anything about this new reality, about this kingdom. Jesus called it the kingdom of God, this kingdom that he came to bring. It's coming physically when he returns, and everybody will see it. At this point, it's only visible by illumination, by supernatural illumination. And that's why Jesus said to Nicodemus, he said, you, you have to be born again to even have the ability to see this kingdom. At this point, revelation is the only way to view it. It's what Jesus told Peter. He said, flesh and blood can't reveal this to you. But here's the wonderful news. The Holy Spirit lives inside every believing Christian to reveal it. He wants to show us the kingdom of God. He wants us to see this new creation. He wants us to see what Paul saw. But... He waits for us to pursue the revelation. <laughs> and if that seems strange, that's because God is really all about the relationship with us. That's why he doesn't just download truth on us that we don't ask for. Because if he did, we'd never talk to him. I mean, that's just, <laughs> that's just the reality, isn't it? I mean, if God just gave me everything or downloaded everything to me, I'd never talk to him. So th th that has been probably the biggest struggle for me to understand. I'm thinking, God, why do you want me to talk to you? You know what a mess I am. I mean, how could this mean what did you say it does? You know, that you, do you actually like the sound of my voice? And the answer, amazingly, is yes. Yes, he likes to hear your voice. In, in Jeremiah 33, 3, God said, call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you don't know. God wants to reveal truth to us, but he waits to hear the sound of our voice. Uh, Isaiah said it, he, he waits at, at the sound of your cry. When he hears it, he'll be very gracious to you. And I'm telling you, when you just get a little bit of what Paul saw, you will start to encounter God in ways that you, you never knew were possible, all right? Because when I was in my 20s, I got started on this journey, and I, I only got a little sliver of this. I just got a teeny bit. I was looking back at some of my old messages where <laughs> I had just one or two little pieces of revelation. At one point, I literally think I preached the same message for a whole year. I mean, people would go, not again. You're really gonna do this again? I'm, but, but I was seeing it, I was getting life from it. It, was, it wasn't a lot, but I was locked in to the spiritual reality of what Paul was saying and seeing and the effect it was having was profound. It was freeing me from sin. I mean, it was changing my thought life. It was mostly coming, after, uh, coming uh, out of chapter six in Romans that I had memorized of Christ setting us free from the power of sin. And uh, I'm telling you, it rocked my world. It, it, it changed me. I still run into people who, who say, you know, 
it rocked theirs as well and are still walking in the light that God gave us in those early years. Let me give you the first passage that really came online for me. And uh, this one just so lit up. This was like, you know, every message I think I found this passage. It's, it's not Romans, but it's, it's part of Paul's revelation. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, Paul makes this statement. He says, but we all, speaking of us, the church, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, if, if you go back to what he's talking about, he's talking about Moses and the veil that they had to put over his face when he would meet with God. He'd come out, and he was glowing, and they couldn't look at him. So they, they put a veil over his face because it was hurting their eyes. Paul's saying, we don't need a veil. We can peer into the glory of God without being blinded because of what Jesus did in making us righteous. And here's what's phenomenal about this. In fact, I'll, I'll pose this as a question. Who do you see when you look in a mirror? It's not a trick question. <laughs> Come on, somebody answer me. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> You're afraid to talk in church, aren't you? <laughs> you see yourself. So if you're seeing the glory of the Lord in a mirror, where's the glory of the Lord? It's in you. That's pretty amazing. It's in me. I'm seeing the glory of God. All right, so what in the world is he talking about? What mirror reflects that? Because I sure don't see that in my bathroom mirror, do you? I look at myself and think, wow, you need help, serious help. <laughs> <laughs> gray hair does not perform like normal hair. I mean, it's, it's just, you know, there, there's only one mirror that accurately reflects the new creation, and that mirror is God's Word. And specifically, a huge part of that is Paul's revelation in Romans. That's more what he's talking about. Here, here's another part of what he's saying. Mirrors in his day were just a piece of polished metal. So at best, you know, you got a blurry picture of what you look like. And yet he's telling us that even a dim understanding of who we are, even dimly peering into the glory of God, in, uh, at the glory of God in prayer and worship, is transforming. It's both. It's actually seeing yourself in the mirror, uh, seeing the new creation in you, and just <clears throat> peering at the glory of God that we can now do by revelation of the Holy Spirit. Paul says, uh, in, in his letter, Paul's given us the true reflection here of our born-again spirits, what they look like. Jesus talked about being born again, but he didn't explain it. He explains it to Paul, and Paul explains it to us in Romans. Through Jesus' sacrifice, we're made righteous, he says, with the very righteousness of God himself. It's a gift. Paul says that a great exchange took place where God put, took, took our sins and laid them on Jesus and took his righteousness and imparted it to us. And that we have been made free from the power of sin by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That's just a little sliver. That's a fragment. Of, but it's loaded for bear. I mean, that is a huge statement. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Paul just kind of pulls back and, uh, and he lets us see the big picture. In fact, let's just read this together, all right? If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, notice he says all things because the new creation affects everything about us. It changes everything. The moment you were converted, the moment you were born again, a miracle happened in your spirit. Your spirit was ignited, brought to life, and the Holy Spirit actually came and took up residence inside you. So now you have the living presence of the uncreated God dwelling in your spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 17, Paul says, but the person who is joined to the Lord is what? one spirit with it. If I made a statement like that out of the blue, you'd think I was being sacrilegious, wouldn't you? You know, the person who was joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. That sounds blasphemous. I mean, that sounds what? But there it is. 
It's in your Bible. You've been born again. Your spirit is alive and one with Almighty God. You are hardwired with a direct God connection. He's in your spirit. Think about that. He's never going to leave you. The power is always on. Anytime you connect, this is, this is my model. Anytime you connect with your spirit, you're connecting with God. When you dial in to your own spirit, you are connecting with the Holy Spirit because he's, he's, he's one with you. He's one with your spirit. Man, that was, a, that was a shocker to me to realize he's in me. You know, I'm trying to get to him. He, he's dialed down. Don't dial out, you know. <laughs> God! He's, no, God, God. Holy Spirit, river of living water. The one who is one with my spirit. Now, back to what he was saying here in 2 Corinthians 3, 18. He says, it says, we gaze intently at this new reality that our new legal position becomes our living condition. We'll get into that. That's how the transformation occurs. We start to experience the stuff we're looking at. That's the idea. And that's the goal. We want to encounter this new reality of who we are in Christ. Paul peppers everything he writes with that revelation. It's, it's throughout his epistles. By the way, there's a new movie out on the, uh, the life of Paul that everybody's raving about that, that goes right along with what we're talking about. Y'all seen it? Oh, man. Man. All right, Philemon 1.6, Paul's prayer here is that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. That's a whoa. Seeing this reality is what generates the faith to experience it. It's acknowledging what's true, what's right, what's there. Here's how Paul says it in Romans 10, 17. He says, faith comes by hearing that and hearing by the word of God. So it's hearing and hearing and hearing these truths, hearing them come out your own mouth. Like this statement in Romans 5, 17. He says, I have received the abundance of grace, the gift of righteousness, and I will reign in life through Jesus Christ. That's what causes my faith to become effective hearing the truth about who I am to him and who he is to me the, and, and in me. The idea is you don't just look at this occasionally. You want to make spending time in front of God's mirror as much a habit as you do a bathroom mirror. And I'd say you do quite a bit of that because you all look fairly good this morning. I mean, <laughs> you know, I, I do it because I want to know what you're seeing when you look at me. <laughs> You know, that I don't have bed head or that, you know, my teeth don't have lettuce stuck in them and green drink on my lips. You know, you, the, you, you spend some time in front of that mirror. We spend a lot of time looking at ourselves. Paul's saying you need to do the same with this because this is the true reflection of who you've become in Christ. Now, now it wasn't just Paul. James comes along and says something similar in James 1.23. He says, anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. He's saying, here's the crux of the problem. This is why you don't look and behave more like Jesus. It's not as much a matter of obedience as it is a lack of revelation. When, when we're not seeing ourselves accurately, it's gonna come out in our behavior. I'm gonna misbehave because I'm not seeing who I am. I, man, I am so trying to stay on track because there's a rabbit trail that I'd love to take right now, and I won't do it. What we see is what we'll be able to experience. It's, it's why we want to take these truths. We want to get them into our dialogue with God. We want to talk about them with each other until it gets in our hearts and our minds, our emotions. I really believe if we could see what Paul saw, we could live like Paul lived. And there's no question the guy lived a supernatural lifestyle, but it was, it was all because of what he was looking at. The way he lived was a direct result of what he was seeing. Peter was able to walk on water as long as he was looking at Jesus. He got his eyes off Jesus, and it didn't work. <laughs> that's, what, that's what this is about. We're wanting to see what Paul saw so we can live like Paul lived, because this dude went through some unbelievable hardship. 
including literally being tortured for his faith. He was beaten, stoned, shipwrecked, imprisoned, lied about, persecuted, and that's a short list. And yet he calls it momentary light affliction. He said, it's nothing compared to the joy of knowing Jesus. <laughs> I read that, I wanna know you like that, Lord. I mean, I get bummed out when the sun doesn't come out three days in a row, you know? I want to see him for who he is. I want to know who I am to him. I want to feel the tenderness of his affections for me. I want to see all he is to me and in me. I want to encounter this new creation life. I don't want to be living like a homeless beggar with the wealth of heaven in my spiritual bank account and the life of God dwelling inside me. I, I don't want to be living in the dark with the light of the world in my recreated spirit. And Isaiah 60, verse one, God says, arise, shine, your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. He's talking to us. It's, it's this hour, this time, this, this dispensation that we're in right now when the presence of the Holy Spirit of God is living in people and not a temple. It's always intrigued me, you know, when Paul addressed the church in Corinth, which is one of the most carnal, I mean, oh my goodness, these people were mired in junk. Sin-prone groups, you know, I mean, they're just into all kind of craziness. His major appeal to this church is to wake up to their new righteous identity in Christ. <laughs> I would have yelled at them. He instead encourages them to pull out of sin and addiction by basically appealing to them as new creations. He says, wake up to righteousness and stop sinning. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 34. You want to look that up. Here's the issue. This is, this is the crux of what Paul saw. He, Paul defines self-control as a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's another big insight. Which means anything I try to do for God won't work. It won't produce lasting fruit. Paul explains that there are two methods of operation in this world. One produces death, the other produces life. And I know I'm, you know, just hitting this with blinding speed, but remember this is the introduction. We're just trying to get an overview. I'm, I'm gonna, we'll detail this in the coming weeks. He says, anytime we set our mind on our human ability, it leaves us powerless at the heart level. The reason is something called, he calls the law of sin and death. It's like the law of gravity, it's a constant. You know, the, the, it's, it's always pulling us in the wrong direction. But if we set our mind on the spirit, we get a totally different result because remember who's living in our spirit, right? The Holy Spirit, it, we've been joined to the Lord. So just that shift in focus is enough to liberate us. That's what he's talking about in Romans eight. That's the entire chapter basically. He's saying the law of the spirit of life is what separates the law, mindset on the flesh is death, the mindset on the spirit's life and peace. So Jesus' presence by the Holy Spirit is what liberates us. When we set our mind on the Spirit, it kicks us into supernatural gear. It's kind of like the law of aerodynamics. Suddenly we can overcome the law of gravity. We overcome this law of sin and death that's working in us the same way, by this new law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. It's just a shift of focus. Now, you know, I know what your head is doing. It, same thing mine used to do. It, it's going tilt. This can't be that simple. That cannot work. It actually does work. It actually does work. You say to yourself, I put no confidence in my human ability. I put no confidence. Here's the law of aerodynamics for Christians. <laughs> this, this is my paraphrase of Paul's statement in Philippians 3.3. He said, we are the true people of God who worship in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and read this with me, and put no confidence in the flesh. When I read that, I think, that right there is the crux of all my problems. <laughs> you know, I have been trained to put all of my confidence in the flesh. It's the essence of self-help. You know, it's, there's a lot of that teaching in the church right now. I'm gonna do this for you, God. Just you wait and see. Or, I'm not gonna do that anymore. I'm gonna be a good boy this time. Now, it never works because of the law of sin and death that is working in my flesh. So, this is the reverse of that. This is acknowledging I can't do anything without the Holy Spirit's power, which is contrary to my human nature. That's why that's so hard to stay on that track. 
First thing I try to do after I receive forgiveness is to pay God back. Now, I don't, I, I don't think through all of this stuff. I don't realize that's what I'm doing, but that, that's exactly what it is. You know, uh, you know, I'll make this up, Lord. You know, I, I, I'll even be nice to the jerk at work. I, 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 you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make up for what I did. But what I fail to understand is that even though the spirit of Jesus is living in me, this other law is at work in my flesh. And I can over, only overcome that law of sin by abandoning my flesh, by saying, I am helpless to do anything. I put no confidence, I don't put a, I, I put no confidence in, in a single thing my mind or my emotions are telling me right now because it's all skewed. It's full of sin and depravity. I'm gonna shift my focus over to God, over to the spirit that lives in me. I'm gonna tap into this new recreated life inside me. You know who gets at least a little bit of this? The 12-step people. Because step one is to admit you're powerless to overcome your addiction. And it's not just a one-shot deal. You're gonna be powerless to overcome for the rest of your life on this planet till you get a new body. It's, it's, a, it's why the first two things Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount are blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And blessed are those who mourn their condition. Blessed are those who stay aware of it because they'll be comforted, they'll get help. Humility looks so pathetic. I mean, it looks weak, but it's actually where our help comes from. God gives grace to humble people. He resists the proud, but he gives grace to humble people who acknowledge their weakness and dump any trust in themselves. And it's just the opposite of the way I was brought up to think. I can't even get humility right. You know, I humble myself or a day or so, and I'm ready to write a book on how I achieved humility. <laughs> I get proud of my humility. Paul says, <laughs> you're never gonna get it. It's all, there's always gonna be a twist. Your, your flesh is always gonna twist things. It's always gonna mess things up. He says, it's a fruit of the Spirit. He produces that in me by first revealing my helplessness. Because I, you know, Honestly, think, Lord, you know, I could do some really cool stuff for you. You're gonna be glad you have me in the kingdom. <laughs> I'm out of the ditch five minutes, and that's where my deceitful heart goes. The Bible says my heart is so wicked that I need a continual searchlight on it just to keep me dependent. Debbie and I were just sitting, talking the other night, and I looked at her and I said, I am so messed up, I am just so broken, I, I'm so weak, and she looked at me, she said, Ron, we all are. <laughs> I said, well, the older I get, I don't think it's just age, I think it's, it's that we've been pursuing the Lord, I think God's just turning up the light and going, okay, you know, you're, you wanna experience more, here's how it happens. I'm gonna show you how messed up you are, how you can't do anything without me how broken we are. That's, that's one of the continual prayers that I pray for myself and for us, is God, you know, expose the brokenness of my heart till I am mourning my condition and putting all my trust in you and not myself. Whole Christian life is about weakness. Paul talks about being caught up into heaven at one point. Now, this guy was such, I mean, he was, an extraordinary believer. I mean, just total heart and soul. And so at some point in his life, I guess the Lord looks down and thinks, you know, I can trust this guy. So Paul gets caught up to heaven. He sees and hears things that are just inexpressible. No human's allowed to, to just see this and live, but he did. And, and, and he's not allowed to even tell what he saw. But in 2 Corinthians 12, 7, he says, so to keep me from being becoming proud. Now this is the mighty apostle Paul, to keep me, Paul, from becoming proud. I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan, a special demon, <laughs> to torment me and keep me, to keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord, come on, Lord, take this away. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in what? Weakness. So 
Now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Anybody here doing that? <laughs> taking, taking pleasure in your weaknesses? You know, in insults, hardships, persecution, the trouble you suffer for Christ's sake? I'll give you the microphone if you wanna come up here and teach us how you do that. James 1, 2 says, when trouble comes your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. <laughs> do you do that? <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> Me neither. And you know what? I honestly don't think, I think it's because we're not trying hard enough. Because I could get up here and say, okay, guys, let's pump ourselves up here. We, we got to try harder to rejoice in all this bad stuff that's happening to us. Let's celebrate, let's celebrate our not being able to pay the bills this month. Let's celebrate, you know, by all the mean stuff people are posting about us on social media. You know why we can't do that? Because we're not seeing what Paul saw. Paul saw something so upside down from the way we see things, that he could actually rejoice in his suffering and weakness. He says, I'm discovering that the power of Christ works through me in miraculous ways when I'm weak. <laughs> uh, that just, you know, you can say you get that, but let me follow you around this week. I can prove you don't, you know, just like you could prove I don't. It just blows me away. He's saying our strength to overcome the powers of darkness comes out of dependence, not human strength. It's setting our mind on the spirit's life in us that frees us from the law of sin and death. And again, he's talking about the gravitational pull of sin. Because none of us has to work hard at sinning, do we? Whew. It's just the way things are, you know? It's the way we're gonna go unless our minds are intentionally set on the spirit. It, it's what Jesus said in John 15, five. Without me, you can do what? Nothing, nothing. Oh, come on, Lord, I can do a little bit. You know, that's the way my mind works. Okay, so, great, Ron, you backed us into a corner. What, how, how do we do this? What exactly do we do? I love the fact that Paul answers that. <laughs> Ephesians 5, 18, he says, this is what you do. All right, here it is, right here. Be filled with the Spirit. Now, here's how to do it. Read it with me. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the answer to the human dilemma. Stay filled with the Holy Spirit. He's talking about getting your soul He's already in your spirit. He's talking about getting your soul, your mind, your will and emotions filled up by speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and giving thanks. Every time we do that and we engage our hearts in it, we're, we're leaning into that living Holy Spirit connection that's in us that's always on. Oh, anytime we visit our kids in San Francisco, uh, where they live, uh, we see, you know, streetcars are everywhere. It's the, one of the big modes of transportation there. And all the tracks, you see it right there, have cables over the top. And as long as that car is in contact with that overhead wire, it can endlessly go up and down those California hills. I mean, it has power, the power's on. The minute the cable comes off the wire, and it does happen, the motor just, it doesn't just idle down like a gas engine. I mean, it's off, no juice, boom, you're dead. So that's kind of the, the picture that I think would help us. If, if we wanna bear spiritual fruit, if we wanna experience a life that Paul says is in us, that's always on, we have to have that connection. We have to be aware of that life. And to do that, you have to dial down, not dial up. You have to dial down. That's why. Coming together for worship and prayer is so vital. We need to be in an atmosphere, in an environment that helps us connect. Because I'm distracted right now wondering what the latest news is because there's a little thing that pops up on my pad up here. <laughs> or who posted, somebody just posted something cool on Instagram. Look at that. 
We have got to come off of this amphetamine of entertainment that we are so addicted to if we want to experience this life. We have to quiet our soul, we have to be still. Most of us are just way too dialed in to this world of endless entertainment that's now on our smartphone. You don't have to have a pad. You can get it anywhere. I mean, it's just, it's just amazing to me. The spirit-filled life that Paul talked about is all about connection. It's gazing in a mirror till you actually wake up to who you are. It's putting zero confidence in your flesh. It's setting your mind on the spirit and, and boasting in your weakness rather what, than what you can do for God. It's all those things. It's, all, it's a combination. Now, can you see how counterintuitive this is? This is why if you're not involved in a small group of Christians, the, the, who, friends who are focused on pursuing this with you, you're not gonna get this. This is gonna be vague. You're gonna, you're gonna be powerless. You're just gonna kinda be a you know, ping pong ball bounced around by circumstances. If you're not in it, I'm just gonna be bold about this. If you're not in at least one prayer meeting here a month, how are you ever going to get your mind to settle down? I mean, I, I walked in here. We had been away on vacation for two weeks. Uh, Thursday's our prayer time. I'm walking down there, and, I'm, and we're fasting, which makes it worse. I'm thinking, I don't want to do this. I, I, this is going to be horrible. It's going to be two hours of horrible. I am not wanting to do this. I am just inside, you know, yeah, my m stupid mind, head, goes in that same direction that yours does. You're kidding me. I gotta go hang out with other believers in a little room in the dark for two hours. And, and I walked in there, and John was singing, and, uh, and I've told him this, and, you know, I like John singing, but it wasn't John singing. I walked in there, and my heart melted. I mean, the atmosphere of that room was filled with something so supernatural. It, it was immediate. It was like, what is this? I, I honestly think the presence of God, sat, Jesus said it. He said, if two or three of you gather in my name, I'm there in the midst of them. And we've been doing this enough. There's, there's kind of a, an open corridor that's starting to open up here. I'm telling you, in prayer. You need to get here for this. I, 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 you say, well, it's, you do it at like four o'clock in the afternoon. We used to do it starting at 10 o'clock Friday night and going th to five o'clock Saturday, Saturday morning. This is a whole lot more convenient. <laughs> it's not about convenience. That's what fasting's about, it's about weakness. So we come together Sunday afternoon and all of us are in a bad mood and we, we come to the Lord and we go, here we are, Lord, presenting ourselves in weakness and God meets us. And every time we walk away from her going, wow, you need that. If I need it, I think you need it. I can't do it without it. I, you know, I, I really felt like the Lord said that to me recently. We are hitting, we, we have reached a point where you will not be able to do this alone. You've got to be in an environment where the presence of God is, where you can connect with the Holy Spirit. Christianity is gonna get, it's gonna be incredibly hard for you if you are never in a prayer-centered environment and getting the support of like-minded friends who are going the same direction, talking this new creation stuff with you and encourage you and you in it. This is all we used to talk about as a bunch of young people. It's why we were experiencing it. Nothing you're getting in the world is taking you this direction. I'm no better at this stuff. I'm so honest with you because I want you to know I'm not any better at it than you are. I've preached it 40 years, but I have to do the same thing I tell you. I try cutting lines saying, Lord, you know, I preach this for a living. This ought to be easier for me. <laughs> I have to lean in. I have to depend on the greater one who's living in me. I have to just put the book down and go, okay, Lord, I'll pray my little circle tour here to be reminded continually that he's with me, that he's in me. I have to connect with him. Ryan, you know why you're anxious right now? Because you're not connecting. Here's my challenge for us this week. Let's, let's stop trying to approach God on the basis of our success or failure. Lord, 
Do you see what I did there? That's pretty cool, wasn't it? Or, Lord, I'm such a mess. I don't even know why you love me. Those are the two ways the devil will try to, to, to trick you. One will get you into pride, the other will get you feeling condemned, and both will keep you from connecting with the Holy Spirit who is your strength and the answer to the whole thing. So try approaching God this week just the way you are. Confess any known sin, leave it there, don't try to fix it, don't try to make up for it, just say, okay God, I can't do anything to make myself right, I'm broken, I'm helpless, I receive your forgiveness, and then just lean in. Sing a line of a worship song, a quote a verse of scripture. Thank God for truth that he's starting to show you from his word. Talk to him. Thank him for what he's lighting up in your life. To use the trust prayers. Use the, I use that trust prayer list all the time, over and over and over and over again. Later in the day, if he reminds you again, do it again. I'm telling you, things will start to change. You will start to experience what Paul said. From glory to glory, you'll be transformed. That's what he said in 2 Corinthians 3.18. And it won't be because of your great willpower, it'll be because you are tapping the source of divine life in your weakness. Some of you have said things like, whoa, you know, I, I get it. when you're talking like this, I, I, I'm sitting here, it's like the light comes on, I get it, and then I walk out and it's like it evaporated, where did it go? Well, the same principle applies here, Psalm 36, 9 says, in his light we see light. When we're not in contact with the Holy Spirit, the light goes out. That's why when you come in here, you get into a little bit of worship, and, and the light starts to come on. As I'm teaching a word, you go, whoa, I'm seeing it. And you think, well, why won't this work in the world? It will, but it's the same principle. You do it the same way, you, you say, God, I'm, I'm really feeling helpless right now, I, I, I can't see this. I'm leaning in, I'm asking you for revelation, the spirit of wisdom and, and revelation. That light will come on. Get here to a prayer meeting. Every Thursday, 12 to two in the foundry, four to six, first and third Sunday, right here in the main room. That's next week. I'm telling you, this really will change, but it's incremental. Isaiah 28 says, here's how the Holy Spirit teaches us. Precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. It's one truth at a time, one aspect of this, one facet of this diamond at a time. So take, take maybe one of the verses that lit up for you today. And as you are sitting here, the Holy Spirit's in this room. He's here right now. <laughs> I'm telling you, he is here right now. He is in this room, and he is illuminating. Some of you, you're going, wow, you know, I never saw that. Well, that didn't come from me. That came from the Holy Spirit. He, he, he lit that up for you. So get it into your dialogue with God. Talk to him about it today. Dial down, not up, down. Over and over, just say it. Say it to him. God, give me more light. Watch what happens, guys. Stand up with me. I, I'm going too long here. I'm meant to quit. Is this making sense? Okay, that's good to know. I, I went, I, you know, we went at the big picture. We'll, we'll narrow it down in the weeks ahead. Okay, Holy Spirit, I'm asking you right now, take these truths. Just marinate our hearts, our minds, our soul in these truths, let, us, let these truths come alive in us. Let this reality that Paul saw so clearly, God, become clearer and clearer to us in the days ahead. We wanna function, we wanna operate in the Spirit. We wanna be people of the Spirit. Help us, touch us, in Jesus' name.